So remote work, where are we? Well, here we all are busily making our way to the corporate office, an average of two hours spent commuting per day, sometimes in the rain, all that time lost, never to be returned. Maybe this picture goes a little too far to make the point, but nevertheless, the contrast is a real one. This guy hasn't had to suit up. He hasn't had to burn time on the commute. He's being productive from his boat. For me right now, I'm not on a boat, but I am quite happy broadcasting this webinar from my garden shed in West London. For many employees, the work-life balance advantages and flexibility that remote working brings are worth as much as 20% of their salary. And this number is growing, I'm told. It's not hard to see why the vast majority of the office-based workforce are voting to stay remote. 50% of the FTSE 100 companies are stating that they will be adopting or promoting remote working going forward. Big companies like Facebook and Twitter are all saying that this is how we're gonna go and how we're gonna go to work and work going forward. And why wouldn't we with the green credentials alone would be a compelling enough reason. Believe it or not, 92% of Google staff recently voted in favor of continuing remote work. Initially, this seemed like the way forward, but more recently, Google CEO stated that he would like to see folks in the office at least two or three days a week. Yet more recently, again, this has been followed by another board member from Google, who's actually Thomas Kurian, who's the ex Oracle 2 IC, stating that Google are going to let individual regions decide what works for them. It would seem you can't hold back this tide. People always accuse banks of moving slowly, but two weeks after lockdown one in April of last year, Jez Staley, Barclays CEO, said, we are looking to reduce office space by 80% worldwide. 10 months later, having discovered that walking away from a large portion of their real estate portfolio might not be as easy as one had hoped, Jez has changed his mind, and now he's stating that he's looking forward to welcoming folk back to the office. No doubt, like you, I'm starting to notice that every pro remote work argument there is an equal back to the office argument. And sometimes they come from the same source. Here we find two respected centers of thought leadership having slightly opposing views as to what we can expect in terms of the size of the shift to remote working. From Gartner, 35% of organizations have already reduced office space. 70% of C-suite conversations now regularly include a debate on office space reduction. I think the numbers from Gartner speak for themselves, fed by feedback from nearly 4,000 organizations. 72% of CEOs, or uh, well, CFOs, sorry, expect to reduce office space in the next two years, with a large number having already done it. This is what I believe underpins Nicole's statement at the top of the page here, that there is no going back, because in practicality, if your office gets decommissioned, there's no physical space to return to. A slightly different approach by our good friends at McKinsey and Company, in addition to a 2000 strong executive respondent survey, they actually analyze the practicality of role types and the ability of any given country's infrastructure, industry type and economy to support remote working, almost trying to measure how large the remote working wave could be. For McKinsey, across all sectors, 38% of executive respondents expect their remote employees to work two or more days a week from the office after the pandemic. This is compared to just 22% of respondents surveyed before the pandemic. Contrastingly, just 19% of respondents to the most recent survey said that they expected employees to work three or more days remotely, suggesting that the majority of executives want to see their employees in the office more often than that. But it does suggest that executives anticipate operating their businesses with a hybrid model of some sort, with employees working both remotely and from an office during the work week. Another data point that I like from McKinsey, they claim that before the pandemic, only five to 7% of the workforce worked remotely in some form, either hybrid or total. But that although they believe the vast majority of us will return to the office, they do concede that that five to 7% will grow four times after the pandemic. Like I said, McKinsey opposes some of Gardner's, lar Gardner's larger claims, but this discord between them seems to mirror most of the noise in the media, with no one direction being able to claim victory. What McKinsey do concede is that they believe the increase in remote working will still be substantial enough to affect the sustainable viability of industries like hospitality, retail and transport in the commercial and city centres that they occupied pre-pandemic. A few extra data points for the note takers among you. Since the start of the pandemic, apartment prices in San Francisco have dropped 25%.
This followed by this followed the predominant announcement from the tech industry that the sector was going to em embrace remote working going forward. More of the same, the availability of New York apartment rentals is at its highest ever with over 15,000 apartments currently available for rent. Conversely, the suburbs and countryside properties have boomed as folk have fled the cities. Do you know, I wasn't going to talk about this today, but to make the point a little bit more and then we'll move on. Three weeks ago in the UK, a national rail summit was held to discuss the future of rail travel and the projected change in volumes that might result of this increased move towards remote or hybrid working. To set the scene a little, just the day before the, the summit, Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, suggested that soon everyone would be back in the city centres in their offices and he was fully behind this return to work. Going back to the rail conference, the following day, the head of the UK National Rail Infrastructure introduced their analysis, which suggested that only 80% might return and that they were modelling figures down as low as 60%, that they would need to reduce services across the board and that the commercial sustainability of the railway was going to be greatly at risk. Interestingly, Chris Heaton Harris, the UK government minister for rail, was the next to speak at the lectern. And he simply said things are not going to go back to the way they were before, that this change would be permanent. This was completely opposed to the argument proffered by Boris Johnson, who's his colleague in the cabinet. Again, this just goes further to compound the argument. Is it return to the office or is it stay remote? No one really knows. I think all this direct and indirect data supports our point. There is a definite change. It's happening. And for a lot of folk, it's already happened. The narratives we hear in the media from industry titans and pundits are conflicted. If we tried to base a technology infrastructure strategy on that basis, we really wouldn't know what to build. Do we do the office or do we do the other thing? But really, it's all just noise. We need to rise above that and ask ourselves, what is the problem we're actually trying to solve? I believe the real challenge is providing secure, performant and agile application access in any setting. That way, it doesn't matter if someone's working remotely or if they are working in an office. I think if you make working remotely the default setting, then any infrastructure you provide in a secure, performant and agile way will accommodate all the scenarios that the organisation may wish to adopt or grow towards. When COVID first kicked off, the technical challenge was needs must. We had to quickly accommodate remote working. It was just get it done. In some cases, we widened our pool of VPN clients. We used RDP or ramped up our VDI solutions. But in every case, we've run into problems as a result. VPN is great, but we never expected all of our users to be VPNing into the network. Hitting obvious choke points, RDP, well, I'll say no more, but more commonly, VDI solutions like Citrix and VMware were ramped up, commonly creating millions of interactive video streams running all over the net. No one would ever thought or suggest that this is an efficient way to support remote working, certainly at this, not, at this new supra scale. I'm constantly bombarded with prospects who are suffering with drop connections, slow service and angry users. But in fairness to us all, what we did at short notice was make it happen. I remember writing an article last April literally saying how proud of our sector I was, how in a lot of cases overnight we'd made this work for organisations and their users. I will conclude now, though, or concede now, that this was needs must at the time and pretty much solved with sticking plaster solutions. So I'm going to call it remote work 1.0. I think we will all agree that 2.0 is needed if we're going to support the infrastructure more strategically. How do we do that, I hear you ask? Well, we need to move our business applications closer to their web native siblings like Office 365 and Salesforce, not multi-tenanted in the cloud sense, but certainly native to the internet. That's a bit of a problem for us folks that look after or support host applications on mainframe, iSeries or Unix systems because our applications tend to be stateful. And guess what? The internet is a stateless setting. What does that mean exactly? Well, we connect to our applications with terminal emulators, but essentially the host system has no idea that our emulators aren't directly attached via cable to the host itself. The connection is real time and interruption to that stateful connection will essentially drop the connection. And guess what? You get a lot more interruptions when you start to add more transport layers like VPN and Citrix bottlenecks. So how do we solve it? Well, it would be great if we could convert those terminal emulators to HTML on the fly, wouldn't it? Essentially changing our stateful application into a stateless one and therefore making it a first class web citizen all in one hit. Converting the emulation to HTML essentially makes the application access native to the internet and TCP IP. So interruptions to connections and the joys of traversing public infrastructure no longer present our users with drop connections. 
Also, making it in HTML is far less resource consuming across the board from data bandwidth all the way through to processing power of the endpoint, making it far more usable for our remote workers. There are other benefits too. We can then natively use all the latest security from HTTPS to TLS 1.3 or multi-factor authentication. You'll see I've added the human challenge here. I'll speak to it briefly as I think this is a separate webinar in its own right, to be honest. But moving the workforce to a remote setting changes things. It adds digital friction. Some of that friction is the technology difficulties I've mentioned, but equally it can be the analog endpoints of a current office setting process. To give you an example, I used to fill out a form and leave it in the in-tray at the accounts department, but I'm no longer there, so I can't do that. So what do I do now? Now, our good friends at Gartner would suggest that this is where automation navigators enter the fray. Folks in the organization prime to go looking to pick up these endpoints and, and automatically tie them back together, essentially looking to solve or automate these previously analog operations and procedures. Like I said, Maybe I'll do another webinar, I'll write an article on that subject for folk later. So I'm going to describe an approach to achieving the transformation of business application access 2.0, but I'm going to use Flynet as a contextual anchor. So to understand a little bit about Flynet, they're kind of this. Anything green on black or orange on black, be it mainframe, iSeries or various flavors of Unix, plus Flynet opens you directly to providing access anywhere on any device in any setting. Flynet is the perfect partner for taking these applications to the cloud. I would say that Flynet are actually the best RPA solution for host system automation as well in the market at the moment. Is it? And I say that in a kind of non-partisan way, getting to look across the space on a relatively frequent basis. Or a great accelerator for legacy system owners wanting to move towards DevOps and high-velocity application development, delivering um, uh, delivery, sorry, using commodity skill sets like .NET, et cetera, moving away from things like COBOL and RPG. And finally, they're the ideal partner to remove the big bang from any migration or modernization strategy. So what does this actually look like in practice? Well, you can see here, we've added a small server in between the end user and the host system. The Flynet server actually connects to the host system via Telnet or Telnet over SSL, TLS or SSH. All your client sessions will actually be intercepted here and converted into HTML on the fly. A single small virtual machine can support thousands of concurrent connections. Each session is only about 50 kilobytes in size, hence the thousands. If you need tens of thousands, you simply load balance in more virtual machines. But you'll notice a big difference between a couple of thousand users on one VM rather than just 30 users on a Citrix VM. Far more scalable and in a way that provides the service that's native to the internet. From a user's desktop, tablet, or mobile device's web browser, you can securely access your terminal session. Any interruptions to the connection or bad network coverage, Wi-Fi dropouts, for example, are irrelevant because you're essentially accessing a secure, stateless web page. Your terminal session is safe on our server, protected from the inconsistencies of the internet, allowing you to seamlessly reconnect to the same terminal session at any time. In this scenario, you may never even notice that an interruption actually occurred. This method of key business system access is agile. You can connect to it from any device without any proprietary software or plugins. And you can do this from any location, office or remote. It's secure using the latest banking level security and it's performant many, many times faster than traditional terminal emulation. This will work with any browser on any desktop and you'll see they, your terminal sessions actually remain on our server and then are only accessed interactively via HTTP, keeping the data between the host and uh, the client to an absolute minimum. And you'll see there that this can support any um, host system, IBM mainframe, iSeries, Linux, Unix, VMX, PIC, uh, PIC uh, for those of you that have come across PIC in your time maybe. Is it... Um, so what does the actual core stack look like? Just to add some practical, uh, just before we do the practical demonstration, I'll create some context. You'll see here, Flynet essentially have a core terminal emulation server. And on top of that, we run our pure web terminal emulation software. So that's pure HTML, no plugins or applets, no client side software. A separate product in the suite, the user experience application allows you to build modern web responsive interfaces onto those old screen, older green screen interfaces, should you want to. Additionally, the web services application allows you to create RESTful and SOAP web services directly to the application functionality in the green screens, green screens themselves. Finally there, the Flynet Viewer Studio tool is a known low code app IDE that allows you to build those UXs and those web services should you want to. 
To avoid confusion, though, I will say that the Finite Viewer Terminal Emulator is a full-featured premium enterprise-level emulation solution that just works out of the box. It takes about 15 minutes to install on a server, and then you can practically deploy it to thousands of users straight away by emailing out a link to, that TE, TE, uh, to the TE server. No trouble at all. Just to create some deployment context, a typical on-premise architecture might look like this. You can see all your typical network architecture components, firewall, DMZ, various switches. Flynet is a first-class web citizen, so won't be broken or slowed by any architecture set in front of it or used to harden your environment. Flynet is essentially just a sophisticated website, so you can load balance it in a secure way, in the same way that you could secure any website or web application. We can see here in a cloud setting, a lot of organizations have cloud destinations in their strategy or even more simply software defined data centers. Flynet again is a web native comfortably sitting in any setting. Flynet are partnered with the three big cloud providers. You can hydrate a Flynet server in Azure and Oracle or install to bare metal, install to bare metal on AWS. At this point though, I think is a good juncture now we've set the kind of technical setting for me to hand over to Mark Bain who will give you a quick technical look-see at the application itself. So hi, I'm Mark, um, I'm the techie here. Um, I'm just gonna briefly look at um, the terminal emulation that um, Chris has been uh, talking about earlier. So um, you can see here, it's a terminal emulation in a browser. I can uh, sign in, move around, just exactly the same as I would uh, my desktop emulator. But of course, it isn't a desktop emulator, it's running inside my browser. And it can pretty much be any browser. You can, you know, uh, New Edge, Old Edge, IE, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and it could also be your desktop Windows 10 installation or your, your Android tablet or iOS tablet or phone. Um, but what you're getting is your terminal emulation appearing in your browser and it's pure HTML. So it's not using ActiveX or um, uh, Java plugins, which are both compatibility and security nightmares. Um, so it's pure web, which is partially why we're able to deliver the terminal emulation to so many different platforms, because it is using pure web standards. Um, and just because it's inside a web browser and it's running as a, a web page, doesn't mean that you have to make any compromises on the kind of features you get from your emulator. So the kind of features you find on a premium desktop emulator, you will still find inside the uh, Finite web-based one, uh, such as things as, oh, sorry, got to move this control, wait, um, uh, such as a screen history. your screen history, uh, you've got uh, printing, file transfer, uh, macros, graphical keyboard remapper, all that kind of thing. And of course, um, uh, properly resizable in the, the live mouse is playing up. <laughs> there we are. Um, properly resizable. It wouldn't be a demo if there weren't some uh, technical hiccups. Thankfully, it was with the mouse, mouse and not the actual application. So, um, so all the kind of features you expect to find in a premium desktop emulator, even things like such as macros, uh, single sign-on, uh, all that kind of thing, uh, keyboards um, for uh, when you're using an, a, a touchscreen device that don't have function keys, things like that. Um, it's uh, able to be restyled. You can have your own colors. Um, you can give it a corporate identity, et cetera. So um, uh, all the kind of features you expect uh, from a premium desktop emulator, but delivered through a browser in a pure web solution without using any plugins. Um, and this, of course, then makes it very easy to secure and deploy through your normal corporate infrastructure or organization infrastructure. So you can protect this using standard uh, web hardening proxies and DMZs. Um, you can obviously put it through SSL, as Chris was mentioning earlier. You can do corporate directory integration into things like Azure, Active Directory, OAuth, OpenID, uh, Active Directory, LDAP, that kind of thing. Uh, and you can also use two-factor authentication systems. So this allows you to publish it securely over public infrastructure. Of course, you can still use things like VPNs and stuff to keep it uh, that extra layer of security on top. But because it's just a fancy web page, um, you can the way in which you would secure any other, you know, organization-wide um, web application, you can apply to uh, Flight Viewer as well. So you, you can secure it very easily. Um, and 
expanding on some of the subjects that Chris was talking about earlier about how it works well over wide area networks, public infrastructure is a way that it handles less than favorable connectivity. So there are three main ways in which um, uh, this makes it better than say a desktop emulator, which has to have a constant and uninterrupted pipe between your desktop and uh, the remote device, whereas a browser only actually sends information when information is being sent and received and the, the pipe is no longer being used. So the, there is a thing, it's called silent reconnection. So the user doesn't notice, notice anything. So they're merely using the, the emulator and um, the connection just drops out for a fraction of a second, maybe a couple of seconds, and um, they wouldn't even know any difference. They maybe see a little bit of a delay, but because the session is actually running on the flying of your server, um, the uh, connectivity will just carry on in browser, even though there was a drop between the browser and uh, the client of your server. User is none, nonetheless aware. Um, then there is a prompted reconnection. So if for some reason your connection goes down, your VPN goes down, your Wi-Fi glitches, your cell connection goes off, um, and it tries to silently connect and it fails after a while, um, it then pops up a, a, a box saying, I'm um, sorry, your, your connectivity is gone. Um, can you please check your Wi-Fi or your cell signal and, and, and try and get back on the net? And once you re-establish that connectivity, it will reconnect and you can carry on exactly where you were. Uh, and then, of course, there's this sort of disaster mode where maybe your, your cell phone runs out of battery or your uh, computer, uh, you kick the plug out or something like that and it's completely gone, uh, the sessions can be parked. So there's an option where that when you come back to the landing page of the emulator, um, you'll actually get a list of your existing sessions and you can reconnect to a running session. This also allows you to actually even move between devices. So you can actually have a follow me style um, session where you can pick up your session and run it and uh, use it with a different device. So uh, connectivity all of a sudden across um, unreliable wide area networks becomes much easier to manage. And even if you do drop a connection, it's easy for you to pick them up. So you'll, you'll end up with far less orphaned sessions running on your, um, your, your host because users will be able to pick them back up again and uh, run with them even if they are uh, lose their connectivity. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the, the data flying between the browser and the flying of your server is compressed and it's, uh, it's a delta, it's only screen changes. So the amount of data actually flying across the WAN and through your uh, outward facing network infrastructure is very slim. It can actually, it's never larger than the original data and often it's considerably smaller than the original terminal protocol engine. So the actual data traveling in and out over your internet pipes across the internet and into people's uh, remote office working places, et cetera, um, is it, significantly smaller. And that actually helps as well with um, you know, less than favorable connectivity. Um, and I also mentioned you know, the thing about orphan sessions. Um, even if a session is completely orphaned and the user has lost everything and, they're, and they aren't able to connect again, there are routines inside Flyknit Viewer that let you pick up sessions and either close them or successfully log them off or whatever routines you need to do to, to tidy up orphan sessions. So if you've got a vast number of remote workers, you don't have to worry about having vast numbers of orphan sessions running on your systems. So this combination of uh, being able to publish it securely uh, using st a standard off the shelf, probably your existing infrastructure and how you would publish an enterprise or organization or website securely through public infrastructure. That can still be applied. Combination of that, the ability for it to uh, have your data on a diet and, and make it easy to reconnect to sessions and manage orphan sessions makes us great for remote working. Um, so security, ease of easy secure access yeah, is a good way of putting it. Um, and um, back in the day when this was first being uh, developed, um, we actually developed it in conjunction with uh, IBM, who were working with uh, Tesco in the UK, uh, the, the UK's largest supermarket. And this was all about how they were using terminal emulation on the shop floor on handheld devices. So the, the staff members to this day are still walking around printing shelf edge labels, you know, the, the yellow reduced labels or the little labels on the side of the shelf saying uh, three pounds or two dollars or whatever, and the little belt printers. Uh, and the problem was uh, the mainframe that they were connecting to was in a central location in Chesson. Um, but they were in stores all over the country in uh, Ireland, UK, and further abroad as well. And um, the connectivity was spotty. Not only was it uh, across the WAN, 
but also because um, the uh, devices were in store and the Wi-Fi in a store full of metal cabinets is less than favorable, far, far less than favorable. So being able to build robust uh, connectivity uh, was baked into the product from uh, a very early date uh, working with IBM uh, for the, their customer Tesco, uh, being able to manage these uh, connections over uh, public infrastructure and uh, quite frankly, very uh, unfulfilling Wi-Fi. So, uh, so once you've got this browser, you know, you've protected, you've published it, um, uh, you can make it secure, two-factor authentication, directory, integ directory integration with your corporate directory to secure it. And it doesn't have to be a massive project. It's all very turnkey. It's very easy to do. Uh, once you're on that journey, it also uh, brings you into the, the two, two of the other pillars that Chris mentioned uh, on one of the slides about the Flynet platform. So this is the same application, except this is um, a, a uh, a modernized um, web version. So this is the same green screen application is running by Industries, but you can see I've got point and click. Um, I've got nice uh, buttons and uh, click on. It's a responsive UI, which means if I view it on a mobile device, it will reorganize itself. Um, I'm able to drill down into lists uh, that behind the scenes are drill down lists or multi-role lists, depending on which system you're using. And I can get drop downs and calendar controls. And this is really bringing your emulation into a true web application. And uh, the fact that there's a green screen there is neither here nor there. Um, it is a true transactional fill in a web form, submit the results, or results back. So really it is uh, completely disconnected. Uh, you know, not having to rely on that stateful pipe whatsoever. So the, the, the terminal emulation actually gets your foot on the journey of developing these applications using our studio, which is a low code, no code designer, uh, which allows you to build applications. In fact, this application uh, I wrote here um, is um, uh, created using the designer with uh, no um, uh, coding whatsoever. It's all done by more or less painting the widgets onto the screen. So you can you, you can see you have you have navigational menus. Um, you can build composites or composites depending where you are in the world. Um, that brings information from multiple screens to create new views. Uh, you can create uh, funky things like notebooks where you can tab through various screens uh, and bring whole new methods of working against your original screens. And again, it doesn't break any of the security. It still uses the, the built-in security we all mentioned before. It doesn't bypass any of the security uh, of your host system. Um, last thing I would just say on the, the uh, UX stuff is it also does uh, wizards so it, or workflows and it can pull you through complex processes um, and basically with the next back and previous that kind of thing and it pulls you through doing a, a task and that just makes it easier uh, if you're doing repetitive tasks, less training, that kind of stuff. Um, so um, there we are, that's the web UX. Uh, and the last thing I'll touch on, again, this is all on the same platform. So the, these, this is a, a web services. So this is when you encapsulate the business data and the business logic on your green screens and turn them into standard services, be the RESTful JSON or SOAP XML, that kind of thing. And this is just a test rig. So this is when you build services using uh, the Flynet Viewer Studio, it builds a test rig for you and to let you execute the, the services because normally they're machine to machine or you get your web designers to design a pretty dashboard or application that sits on top or it's machine to machine. But again, you can see here, it built it transactional here. So I can put in my account or policy, I call the transaction and I get the results back. So this is um, a sort of a, a, a task that takes in a parameter of account or uh, a policy and bring back, uh, brings back uh, a pre designed a set of information. What's actually coming back for the techies amongst you is, is JSON. We're just we're just formatting it here to make look it make it look prettier. But once you've got these uh, your green screens turned into these um, services and these web methods, um, the fact that there's a green screen system behind it is neither here nor there. A standard web developer or developer can take these services and build uh, dashboards, web front ends, machine to machine interactions, um, and they don't have to care. You know, they don't know the difference between a coffee table and a mainframe. So it and it doesn't matter. These are just standard services. So um, that's probably everything really 
for uh, the technical side of things. Uh, obviously, primarily we were focusing here on the uh, terminal emulation uh, and how it's easy to make secure, uh, how easy it is to uh, encrypt and protect the data and how it works very well over public infrastructure or less than favorable networks and allows you to carry on and, and work with sessions uh, irrespective of the fact that you're on the, the, the worst ever uh, cell phone connection ever. <laughs>